You really thought you could outwit me, you fools. I've been a step ahead of you this entire time, as you blunder your way through the simplest of tasks. But you've become a nuisance, and it's time to put a stop to this no- What? They can't have taken me out that easily. I didn't even get to use any of my special abilities. What kind of boss fight is that? Wait, I am a boss, right? Hey, Dungeon Masters. <laughs> Sound familiar? Balancing combat in D&D is hard, especially when the systems that are built into the game to help you don't actually work. I'm looking at you, challenge rating. But even a well-planned encounter can go off the rails quickly over a few extreme roles, especially at very low or very high levels. Part of being a good DM is learning to respond quickly to these challenges so that you can make sure that combat contributes to your game. Let's say that you've been building up to a boss battle for months, but when your players finally face off with the big bad, they absolutely curb stomp them. Maybe you only get one round, or your baddie gets stunned, or they never get to use any of their cool special abilities. Or maybe you planned for an encounter to be challenging, but an unexpected streak of high rolls or your own miscalculation allows your players to wipe the floor with your monsters. Of course, it's okay for some combat to be easy, but if you're a beginner DM or if you made mistakes in your encounter prep, it can be useful to know how to dial up the difficulty midway through the encounter in order to correct. As Matt Colville says, encounter design doesn't stop once initiative is called. The work you're doing to create an engaging encounter before the session starts is still important work once you're in the thick of it. Now, I'm not talking about fudging roles, although the Dungeon Master's Guide does offer it up as an option on page 235, interestingly. If you don't mind fudging the numbers, there are some tips in this video for you. But if you don't like that, then don't worry because there are some tips in this video for you too. Nice try, but it'll take more than a fireball to get rid of me. My education is in life beyond death. I'm much harder to kill than I look. This is the obvious solution, but if your players are hitting your bad guys for more than you anticipated, you can always just beef up their hit points. This is the first thing that nearly everybody suggests on forums and chat rooms when anybody asks how to recover an encounter that's turning out to be too easy. Make some quick mental calculations. How much damage are your players dealing per turn? How many rounds of combat were you hoping for? Are they dealing an unusually high amount of damage this round due to crits or limited use abilities like Channel Divinity, or is this level of damage likely to continue round over round? All of this will help you figure out how many hit points to tack on in order to equalize the encounter. By the way, this is also a great way to double check your encounter difficulty while you're doing session prep. Of course, if you've already given any information about the monster's hit points, like saying that it's at half health, for example, you'll wanna watch out for this. You don't want players to know that you're messing with the numbers behind the scenes. That can make them feel like their actions aren't truly affecting the situation. If you've already given some hit point info or you just don't wanna fudge numbers, you can achieve a similar thing by allowing your enemies to heal themselves. This could be a magical ability like life drain or vampiric touch, or they could use potions or items. And if you have a group of enemies, maybe one of them has a healing ability that they can use on the others. Keep in mind, it can be really frustrating for an enemy to heal and undo the damage that the party's already done. If you do let them heal, you can make it more satisfying by giving your players a way to problem solve and stop the healing ability, like taking out the healer character or destroying a cache of potions. Oh no, it's a full moon. Something's happening to me. Oh my god, could it be? Brought to you by the new Penny Dragon Games Kickstarter. A werefluencer. You think I've gone feral? Bargain's Book of Beasts is packed with more than 200 unique new beasts to make your tabletop game a little more monstrous. Cursed to transform into someone who does sponsored videos. The book includes magic items, lore, and 10 new beast-inspired subclasses, like the College of Duet Bard, Oath of the Pack Paladin, Snakebite Stalker Ranger, and Way of the Sacred Beasts Monk. There's only one way to stop a werefluencer. If you pledge to a physical tier in the first 72 Two hours, you'll get a free copy of Firestar Falling, a hundred plus page cosmic horror adventure that takes players from levels one to five. A silver D20. That's a free hardcover. Ah, oh, my head. What just happened? Oh no, are you pledging to a Kickstarter? Did I transform again? Yeah, it's fine though. Now, shush, I gotta get my pledge in before I miss this free book. Why didn't you tell me you were bringing your friends? I would have invited mine too. Inferiorsis 
To increase difficulty in a way that plays well with your narrative, you can always bring in more enemies. Additional enemies can support your main villains, or be more of the same if you feel like you haven't gotten the most out of the creatures that you started with. This could mean that more enemies hear the sounds of combat and come join the fray as backup. It could mean that your big bad summons additional enemies through magical or mundane means. You can even get creative with stuff like your villain raising dead minions as undead versions of themselves, or creatures that get back up again when they fall, like the undead fortitude feature that zombies have. Think about the themes of your primary enemy, and you might come up with some exciting ways to bring in backup that feel in line with those themes. If you severely overestimated how challenging your enemies would be, your next wave can even be more dangerous than the first. Maybe the first wave was just the infantry, and the next wave is the real threat. Or, to quote Qui-Gon Jinn, there's always a bigger fish. If your players are feeling cocky and really thrashing their opponents, you have the opportunity to pretend that the first monster was always meant to be a bait-and-switch. Bring in a much scarier one to decimate the first monster right in front of the party and really put the fear of God in them. This applies to all of these tips, but you should definitely be thinking about how to ensure that these changes and additions make sense. If new monsters show up just as soon as the first ones go down, and and there's no real explanation as to why, it might become obvious to your players that you just don't want to let them win yet. But if there's a narrative reason that reinforcements show up, it'll be easier for your players to accept. I must admit, as much as I love playing cat and mouse, I'm growing tired of this little game. Nom dias liberias visius. Surrender, or you'll see what I'm capable of when I'm not holding back. Let's say that your antagonist's attacks just aren't landing, or maybe they aren't dealing as much damage as you'd hoped. Or perhaps there just isn't enough variety and you need them to be able to do something else. This is a great time for your villain to unveil their super secret, extra powerful abilities or items that they definitely, totally had the whole time, but were waiting for the right moment to use. And by that, of course, I mean give them new stuff. If you don't want to complicate things for yourself, this could just mean giving them more spell slots or more uses of an ability that's turned out to be too limited. But if you want to get creative, this can also be a fun way to problem solve. Let's say that you miscalculated your enemy's AC and it's just way too easy for your party to hit them. What a great time for them to dramatically reveal that they have an item, potion, or innate power that allows them to cast bark skin or mage armor on themselves. Or maybe they have a reskinned, thematically appropriate version of Shield of Faith. Or maybe their weapon just isn't turning out as cool as it seemed like it would be when you initially drew up the stats. Okay, turns out it's a transforming weapon. When the baddie activates it or uses a charge or whatever, the stats change. Now it hits more easily, hits harder, or has some sort of cool bonus effect, like additional flavored damage, or the ability to impose a condition on a failed save. If the thing that changes the combat actually happens in view of the players and as a part of the narrative, it'll feel less like you're making adjustments to the encounter, and more like you just had an interesting, dynamic combat planned from the very beginning. You genius you. Goodness, would you look at the time? I'm late for an appointment. Can't have you following me though, so... Okay, that was a bad example because trapping the party with no warning and no save would be a bit of a dick move, but I was limited with my special effects, so let's just agree to let it slide. Basically, if your villain has any control over the space where the combat is happening, you can give them home turf advantage to help turn the tide of battle more in their favor. This would make the most sense if they're facing off in the villain's home, lair, place of work, or even just a space that the antagonists reached before the party did, so they had time to prepare. Maybe they have a stash of useful items nearby, like additional weapons or single-use potions or explosives. Perhaps they set a trap for the players, or had some sort of defensive weapon or ability, and now they're activating it. This could be a magical trap, some sort of area of effect spell, or even a physical trap, like something that starts flooding the room or lights it on fire. This has the added benefit of introducing interesting new elements into combat that challenge your player's problem-solving skills. Or maybe the villain has prepared places where they could take cover from ranged fire, or put obstacles between themselves and the party. They might be prepared to retreat through a hidden door into a second location that's more defensible. It makes total sense for this kind of thing to be triggered by, say, your big bad reaching half hit points, which can help make this move feel pre-planned. Think about it. If your antagonist knows that they'll be opposed, it's only reasonable that they would be prepared with defensive capabilities, especially on their home turf. Pulling these things out as a last-ditch effort doesn't have to feel cheap, because that's a completely rational move for someone to pull when they notice that they're starting to lose. Your narration and role-playing can really help sell this as a natural progression. 
You! You've slung your last fireball, wizard. Let's see how your friends fare without your little parlor tricks. Get that arsonist in the pointed hat! This point may or may not apply, because it's entirely possible that you are already fighting tactically in every combat. But just in case you're not, once combat starts going south, the time for tactics is nigh. You need to be thinking as strategically as your players are, or more. Keep track of who has and hasn't used their reactions. Make use of abilities that impose disadvantage, deal ongoing damage, and separate players from one another. Avoid being flanked or taking attacks of opportunity whenever possible. Pay attention to what player abilities, like Sentinel or Hellish Rebuke, you have the power to avoid triggering. Make use of cover to make your baddies harder to hit. And if one player is dealing particularly high damage numbers, have the entire opposition focus fire to take them down. Unfortunately, being able to fight tactically is a skill, and if you've ended up in this position because you're a new DM and you're still figuring out how to manage combat, you're probably already doing your best. But as you start to get the hang of all this, learning how to use or not use smart combat strategies for your villains can be one of the most helpful tools for adjusting encounter difficulty mid-game. If you're hitting too hard, you can rein it in and intentionally make tactical mistakes, and if you're not hitting hard enough, you can bring out your most airtight strategic moves. To learn these kind of moves, I would highly recommend looking up videos, forum threads, and other community discussions on specific monsters and combat scenarios in the future, before sessions. Sometimes looking at a monster's stat block isn't enough to give you a complete picture of how that monster can be best used. I can't even count the number of times that a thoughtful Reddit thread has taught me an exciting new way to use a player or monster ability. <laughs> you may think you've won, but death is only the beginning. We will meet again. That's a promise. I know I already said this at the beginning, but I want to be super clear. It is okay, and good even, for some combat to end up being easy. If every battle is deadly, that can be nearly as boring as every battle being a walk in the park. Please don't take this video as me saying that whenever an encounter starts to go the party's way, you should reach in with the hand of God and take away their advantage. If your players have given themselves an edge through clever ideas, excellent planning, or quick thinking, they should absolutely be rewarded for that. And even if they haven't, your players are allowed to occasionally wipe the floor with some monsters, especially if that'll be fun. It's important to use your judgment about when it is and isn't appropriate to change the difficulty of your encounters in response to how well your players are doing. Every single tip in this video should be used sparingly, because the last thing you want to do is make your players feel like their actions have no real effect on what happens. If every time they figure out a way to gain the upper hand in a fight, you take it away from them, they're going to learn to not bother strategizing pretty dang fast. But for those moments when a too easy combat is boring, or even undermines the narrative, don't be afraid to use a little hand of God as a treat. And then next time, combine what you've learned here with the tips in this video about interesting dynamic encounter prep to make sure that you're ready to give your players exactly the awesome battle that you're envisioning in your head.